I'm Mark Crispin Miller. Uh, welcome to this month's first Tuesday's book talk. Uh, the purpose of this series is to provide a forum to authors whose works are either uh, unfairly neglected or un unfairly maligned. Uh, so there's a certain melancholy to these occasions, but we're trying to we're trying to make up for that sort of thing. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome uh, Edward Morgan here tonight, who's the author of a of a terrific book, What Really Happened to the '60s, which um, has been reviewed in Counterpunch, and that's all so far. <laughs> so you know. Uh, since it's, it's a kind of an, an indictment, an analysis of the mainstream media uh, for its uh, as if systematic misrepresentation of that moment in our history, I guess they're not lining up to you know, interview him and review the book and so on, but I, I want to tell you that the book is extremely important because what it does is talk about how um, an invaluable moment of genuine democratic, um, uh, we could call it rebellion, has been caricatured and distorted and uh, translated into a, a moment of purely generational brattiness with a bunch of you know, young people, overprivileged young people, uh, basically went overboard, embarrassed everybody, and it's you know best forgotten and memorialized in films like Forrest Gump and The Big Chill and other uh, classics that really uh, radically miss the point and, and mislead us about what was actually going on back then. Uh, I think the first step toward reclaiming uh, the meaning of that decade, uh, at least for us here tonight, is to listen to uh, Ted Morgan talk about his book is to read the book. Let me urge you to buy the book. It's a university press book. This is an independent bookstore. So if you can actually buy a copy of the book and have Ted sign it, you'll, you, you and he will be that much better off. Uh, something else we can do, of course, is pay attention to and participate in the current uh, democratic upsurge that's uh, centered in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, because that's actually uh, representative of what the 60s was, the so-called 60s was about. So what we'll do tonight, as we usually do, is have uh, our author talk informally 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open, open it up to your questions. Okay, so join me, please, in welcoming uh, Ted Morgan. Is it possible to... <laughs> Um, thank you, Mark. Actually, you've, you gave about half of my talk, so, <laughs> so I'm in good shape now. No, 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 that's good. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for uh, coming. Uh, and I see that there are a few people here who probably remember the 60s, so that's always good, or, although they say you don't remember the 60s if you were there, but anyway. Um, I thought actually I'd start by uh, reflecting that the book starts with Obama's election and the kind of symbolic power of that moment. And I juxtapose that against the campaign in which he went overboard to disassociate himself from what he called the battles of the 60s. And um, so that's kind of the entree into the book. If, if I were writing it today, um, I might start with Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and let me just say a few things about Madison, Wisconsin, because it does tie in with the book. One is that um, the media images of what's happening um, have a kind of contagion about them. It kind of gives people a sense, it, it really could be happening. The people could be really fighting back against a system that's um, been screwing them, to put it bluntly. Um, so maybe this is the beginning of a pro-democracy movement in America. And if you think about the backdrop of those images, the images in the Middle East when there is a pro-democracy movement spreading rapidly, um, one of the pheno phenomenon in the 60s is precisely that. Uh, the very first sit-in in Greensboro led to 60 sit-ins in, uh, sorry, 60 cities of sit-ins 
uh, within two months. And so there was a kind of a, a contagion effect of those very early images, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about. So the images that we see can be inspiring, can spread movements. But <clears throat> at the same time, if you look at the news reports about uh, what's going on in Madison and elsewhere, Ohio, Indiana, um, the news reports are sort of echoing the right wing's argument about what's going on, which is these are greedy public employees, union members, who are juxtaposed against the taxpayers who are fed up paying taxes in a system where they're kind of at the edge of uh, frustration. And um, the, if you, you know, uh, the mass media are basically framing this story that way. Um, so the frame that occurs in the media is very important. And the fact that it reflects a kind of right-wing argument about public employee unions is also a factor of how the media get played out coming out of the 1960s. Um, another thing which is going on, obviously, is this is a very long-running war of wealth against working class, middle class, and poor Americans. It's been going on for at least 31 years, and arguably, I, I'm going to make the point that it starts back in the 60s. Um, and the war against these people is actually, I argue, based on, or successful because it's based on a kind of pseudo-populism. That is, it appeals to people in this country who probably have not had their incomes increase in real terms in 30 years or more. People in this country who uh, are deeper and deeper in debt, who are losing their homes, who are struggling to keep up to not fall behind, who are angry about it. And what's happened is the anger and the frustration of those people is being turned by campaigns that are heavily funded by people who are, in the case of the Koch brothers, billionaires, to get them to turn against the precise mechanism which they could use to make their lives better, government and politics and democratic participation. So that's another piece of this story, and that's another part that goes back into the 1960s. <clears throat> there's yet another piece which is interesting, and that is in today's New York Times, there's a public opinion poll showing that in fact people would like to balance the budgets and their state, meet the state deficits, not by cutting back on the benefits for public employees, not by cutting into collective bargaining rights, but in fact by um, increasing taxes increasing taxes in order to deal with the deficit. Public opinion polls that show that a majority of Americans would prefer that. So we have a kind of interesting situation where public, the public's opinion is kind of not in the picture when the media talk about the story and juxtapose it as um, the sort of taxpayers, the average American, against people who's, um, who are struggling to make ends meet. There's also, in today's Times, a column by Bob Herbert about, um, in which he cites, quotes a, an economist, if I can find the quote, named Richard Freeman, who says that he views the current hostility towards unions by members of the general public, to the degree it exists, as a sign of the erosion of the aspirational nature that has for so long characterized Americans. It shows a hopelessness, he said. It used to be, you have something I don't have, I'll go to my employer to get it too. Now, I don't see any chance of getting it, so I don't want to be the lowest one in the totem pole, so I don't want you to have it either. And I've read letters to the editor in my local paper saying exactly that. We are struggling to make ends meet, so why should we be supportive of our teachers, our police, our fire, and so forth, um, having decent benefits. They need to pay the price too. So I, I think that's a very interesting phenomenon. And I think among other things, it does reflect a kind of um, a balkanization of our society, a sense of I don't have anything in common with these people, so why do I care about what happens to them? So I, uh, that's my kind of intro to the book. Um, now the book. Uh, there's really sort of three stories in the book. The book as a whole is a, is a story of how how did we get, as Mark said, how did we get from an era in which the people had a great deal of hope that their, through their participation they could shape their collective future to an era today where people don't have that hope, 
where people feel there's not much point in getting involved, and if, even if there's a point, I don't see it'll make a difference. So how do we get from A to B? That's the big story of the book, and, and I use a framework which juxtaposes, talks about contradictions between capitalism and democracy. So that's kind of the overarching view. Capitalism is resurgent in the post-war years through consumer demand and through military spending, which gets our economy growing and offers middle-class life to more and more Americans who move to suburbs, watch television, and we have the 50s. In that society are the contradictions which produce the social movements of the 1960s, particularly, obviously, initially racial movements. So um, those movements then, in turn, produce a level of unrest, a decline in profitability of the economy, so that in the 70s, uh, the Trilateral Commission, a corporatist commission, publishes a book about the 60s called The Crisis of Democracy. And the crisis of the democracy is the excess of democracy, as they call it, in the 60s. Excess in the United States, excess in Japan, excess in Europe, <clears throat> because the Trilateral Commission is, consists of those three sort of entities in global capitalism. So, um, in effect then, what happens is a backlash which occurs, and the key to that backlash is really the second story uh, of the book, which is sort of how the backlash occurs through both political and ideological attack on the 60s, but simultaneously commercial exploitation of the 60s. Um, I need to be very mindful of time because of, uh, because of our limited time here, so I should get my watch out, <clears throat> make sure I'm not going too long. Um, now, the book in itself has two sub-stories within it. One is this story I've just sort of suggested. It's the story of kind of what happened in the years since the 60s. And I argue essentially that um, two characteristics have shaped the mass media. The commercial imperative of competitive media, needing to vie for market audience and so forth, have led to the exploitation of images and stories and personalities and celebrities, et cetera, from the 60s for a whole host of reasons. To get people to buy things, to get people into movie theaters, to get people to watch these kind of new, slightly hipper television programs, um, et cetera. Commercial exploitation. At the, on the other hand, there's the ideological backlash to the 60s, and that consisted of, as I say, the corporate entity, but very importantly, a conservative resurgence, a, a resurgence from the right. Um, these two come together with Ronald Reagan. I'm trying to censor myself and move on from point to point before I go into too much, too, too much depth. Ronald Reagan is kind of the person, the persona, if you will, in which these two merge, these two forces merge. He is a commercial for a nostalgia for a simpler time. He effuses sort of simple verities that resonate with people about times when we knew our neighbors and life was stable and people were independent people and, and um, they participated in their local community and life was sort of manageable. Um, and we lived according to family values, et cetera. And that's the sort of rhetorical persona side of Ronald Reagan who was a living advertisement in a sense through that persona for that past. As he put it, the past, a time before the riots, the uh, assassinations, the turmoil over the Vietnam War, which is his way of talking about the 60s. So that's one side of Ronald Reagan. The other side of Ronald Reagan, however, is that his policies of his administration introduced neoliberalism, introduced a let's get government off our backs, let's downsize government these are, this is the rhetoric, and let's turn things over to the market. Let's revive the market. So we have an era, beginning in 1980, in which we use the market and the profitability of the market as a way to, quote, solve our problems. And that's the era which has produced, I would argue, our problems of today. So that's the second part of the book. All of that is reflection of and traces back to what happens in the 60s. 
And this is a little subtler argument. I'm gonna try and be brief and give you a few, a few illustrations, if I can, if I can get this thing to work. Um, uh, well, let me do this. Let me just go straight to the, 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 the characteristics of the media, mass media, that are fundamentally important throughout the story are twofold. One is that the range of viewpoints that we get that give us or explain to us the meaning of events or interpret events, the texts, the words we get in the media fall within boundaries, ideological boundaries. They do not include arguments, um, presentation of evidence to support arguments of points of view that are critical of our foundational institutions in this country, be that capitalism, be that our democratic institutions, be that the belief that the United States acts for good in the world or has a, is defending freedom in the world and so forth. So in the 60s, you have the rise of movements which are in fact arguing from outside those boundaries. Not that everybody is, but certainly the movements are. The civil rights movement within the South fits within those boundaries. Here we have an, a region of the country that's an exception to the nation's constitutional values. We need to bring it into those values, so it's within the boundaries. But the black power movement, the argument that poverty is sort of endemic in our economic structure, or that racism is pervasive in our institutions, or there's an institutional form of racism. The argument that the war in Vietnam is not the United States defending some country against communist aggression, it's the United States waging aggression against that country that has in fact been kept separated because the United States has flouted an international agreement, which was back in 1954 for reunification under Vietnam, which we knew would, would, would result in the election of Ho Chi Minh. It's not the view that sexism pervades our culture. That's, and I don't mean sort of liberal feminism, but I mean the sense that everybody is affected by sexism one way or another, and that it's sort of rooted also in our institutions. So my point here is all these movements contained arguments which were not taken seriously by the media. They were not, you could not find them as part of what some call legitimate discourse in the media. But there's another characteristic of the media which is because of the rise of, particularly because of the rise of television, the power of imagery, the power of drama, the power of conflict, the power of personalities to get us to watch a certain channel or to tune in to a certain news program or to pick up a paper which has a lot of that kind of interesting stuff in it, human interest stories. And this really starts to take off in the 60s because among other things, the 60s provides a lot of interesting images. Now what I want to suggest is <clears throat> those images are have several uh, capabilities, one of which is people can see those images and see meanings in those images which are not part of the discourse of words in the media. So the images, as with Wisconsin, can cause some people to say, that's me, I'm going to go join them. And in fact, literally, that's what happens. So I'm going to start with that. Uh, this is a famous image, one of many famous images of the uh, sit-ins occurring in 1960. Um, the news reports about the image, sorry, about the sit-ins were very narrow. They were about an incident happening right now that something led to it yesterday and it looks like it's a conflict between this group here and this group here. Um, in fact, Newsweek had a headline, um, Squatters' Rights, about the story about the sit-ins. Um, so what I'm suggesting is the text is very narrow and gives you sort of no history, no sense of the movement. What, what's the movement about? However, Robert Moses at the time was a high school teacher in New York. And he sees this and Robert Moses goes on to become a very significant and inspirational leader in the voter registration drive in Mississippi. 
<clears throat> Robert Moses sees this picture at his home in New York and says, or not necessarily this picture, but one of the pictures, the sit-ins when they broke out just grabbed me. The pictures of the Southern students, what I became aware of looking at them was, they looked how I felt. And I responded immediately to that, which he did. He went south and joined the movement. As many people did, seeing these events occurring in the south. Um, Stokely Carmichael, another name that some of you may recognize, another uh, very important leader in the Southern movement and then uh, in the Black Power movement and later in the Pan-Africanist movement, um, was a pretty politically conscious student in uh, the Bronx High School of Science. He, he remembered reading about the sit-ins and thinking them, quote, politically inconsequential. However, he continued, of course, when I, I would completely change my mind the first time I saw on TV young Africans calmly sitting at a counter while racist abuse blows and the contents of ketchup bottles full, of ashtray, full ashtrays and coffee cups were dumped on their heads. That made a believer of me instantly. So that's the power, that's one of the powers of the image. Now, this is the second very important image, obviously, the Birmingham fire hoses or the Birmingham police dogs. When these images occur, America sees the meaning of the civil rights movement. America says, how can the police and the fire department be doing this to people who are simply nonviolently asking for rights that I enjoy and every other citizen enjoys? It, so the image provoked a kind of convulsive popular response, which mobilized a lot of opinion letters to Congress and so forth, and triggered John Kennedy's introduction of his Civil Rights Act bill, which eventually became the Civil Rights Act and a historic piece of legislation. The Selma incident, the bridge at Selma two years later, which I could have shown you, but I won't because of time, um, is another one where the marchers are stopped at the bridge from marching to Montgomery and the state police come up to them and just wade into them, flailing away with billy cubs. And the live footage of that was shown. It cut into the, the film Judgment at Nuremberg, which was being shown that evening, and people were aghast. They said, my god, what is going on in this country? And again, a tidal wave of support for legislation pushed Lyndon Johnson, in this case, to introduce the Voting Rights Bill, which became the Voting Rights Act, a second very historical piece of change. So this is the power of the image. Now what I want to just suggest, because this will kind of open everything up, what do you do if you're trying to protest against the Vietnam War? What do you do if you're trying to protest against sexism when most Americans think what you're protesting against is just the natural way? I mean most Americans, most men and women at the time. So how do you protest against the Vietnam War so that people look at this and say, oh my god, what are we doing in Vietnam? Now think about that. That's strategically extremely difficult to do because the war is 6,000 miles away and although people are getting images of the war, <clears throat> well, let me backtrack. Here's the magazine which talks about the war. Life magazine's cover talks about after a fishing trip, a Marine and his young friend returned to the name of the town, a village, I can't see it, but this is the other war to keep a village free. So the framing of the war, again, is very constructive. However, images sometimes shock us with something different that doesn't seem to fit what we're being told about the war. So this image in 1963 of a protest against the Diem regime Stock, stuns people. It's, we've heard about unrest in Vietnam, we've heard there's something going on that the Diem regime is being protested by Buddhists because they can't practice their religion fully and so forth. And then we see this on the front page of the New York Times. And people are sort of start to say, what is, what is going on there? I thought we were, I mean, and then you see other images. This is a simple image. It's not that people saw a lot of carnage from the war, they didn't. But they would see an image like this and because there was protest against the war, it was being contested, people might say, wait a minute, why is this woman, who's a South Vietnamese woman, being interrogated by US and South Vietnamese troops? I thought we were there to help these people. She doesn't look like a 
enemy soldier. Why, what's going on? This image, of course, from Tet Offensive, this is another little interesting story, and maybe this is a good place to stop chattering. Um, so during the Tet Offensive in 68, the North Vietnamese regular army and the Viet Cong, the guerrilla movement, the National Liberation Front, come out in an open attack against the American and South Vietnamese forces and uh, bases and so forth throughout the South, even in the cities. So the war, the actual war, comes to the cameras, if you will. So there are images which occur because of Tet, which alarm people and sort of by this time the public's about half for and half against the war. But this one is a South Vietnamese uh, police captain shooting this National Liberation Front captive um, right in front of the camera. Um, now, <clears throat> what I want to suggest is um, there's an enormous, enormously important dynamic which occurs when people in these movements are experiencing the war going on, experiencing a media which disregards their views as irrelevant, and here's the war couched within a dove versus hawk debate, which is not actually addressing their view of the war. And people get increasingly frustrated and angry about that. And as Kennedy said, if you don't allow a peaceful revolution to happen, you get a violent revolution. And sure enough, people started to act in ways that attracted the cameras of the media. Because their arguments would not be heard through the media, but they could be seen through the media. So um, I hope this is the right one. Yes, here's this image on the left, which is a Getty Images sample um, rather than uh, the actual photograph, um, shows protesters in Chicago. And what are they doing? They're holding Viet Cong flags, which start to appear in protests in 1965. So this is a symbolic way to express their outrage at what they see their country doing to these fighters for this country that's trying to determine its own independent future. Um, but a lot of America look at that and say, my God, these people are anti-American. They're holding the flag of our enemy. They hate our troops. How despicable could you be? And what you get through these images <clears throat> and the backlash against the images is this sharpening polarization of the United States. <clears throat> this one on the right is, of course, the famous 1968 Black Power salute by Tommy Smith and Juan Carlos on the metal stand. Again, they are symbolically saying, we want to speak for our condition, and they give the Black Power salute. Well, you know, some people look at this and say, how could you do that to your country at the honor, stand where you're being honored for winning? So my point simply is, the, me the imagistic media also provide quick, powerful, evocative ways that can be used by anybody for any purpose, okay? So that's where this kind of ends. Um, what I would actually like to do is leave you with a video clip that illustrates exactly what I'm talking about. And by the way, you know, the, um, well this is actually, a, maybe I could just spend a quick minute on here. Protest, to be effective, as a protest over in the upper left, protest has to reach the audience. So the audience feels more sympathetic to the protest than to the target of the protest. So with the civil rights movement, people looked and said, my God, who are these people beating these people? When you see an anti-war protest, where's the target? You don't even see the target, you just see the people. And the news reports are about them. And they tend to generalize, they're all young people, they're bearded, they're wearing sandals and so forth. Literally, I mean, that's the kind of characterization in the media. So, um, the backlash, I mentioned this. <laughs> it's my grandson. It's a little personal ad there. Um, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, uh, if you only knew. <laughs> anyway, um, where was I? Um, the backlash, yeah, the video's coming. The backlash starts actually in 1964 with Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater uses images of 
a riot which occurs in Harlem. And he says, this is the result of the civil rights movement, this riot. Why? Because they preach civil disobedience. You get lawlessness when you preach civil disobedience. That's just an example. It's just the beginning. Reagan running for governor in 66 does the same with Watts in Berkeley, Nixon in 68, and on it goes. Now, so backlash is important. Martin Luther King. What about Martin Luther King? Smile. <laughs> Martin Luther King, good guy. A powerful, powerful leader. Um, there's a good king and a bad king in the media. The good king was the speaker at the I Have a Dream speech. Uh, the good king was, in comparison to Bull Connor, who's unleashing the police dogs, um, the good, you know, a peaceful man. The good king is also juxtaposed against Jim Clark, the sheriff in Selma. Or he's juxtaposed against the young militants, as they were called, in SNCC, who use a language that's a little, little more fiery and a little more inflammatory. <clears throat> so that's the good king. The bad king is the king that speaks out against the Vietnam War. Um, I'm going to hold that one second. King in 1967 calls the, speaks out against the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own country. And he says, if they don't bring this to an end soon, I am going to doubt that there are honorable intentions behind this war. And if you could say something that was outside the boundaries, that was it. Because it's always honorable intentions. No matter whether you're a hawk or dove, it doesn't matter. And, and the media's response is incredible. New York Times chastises them all over the place. Maybe I can read this to you quickly. Um, New York Times. Uh, start with the Washington Post. King's speech was a reflection of his disappointment at the slow progress of civil rights and the war on poverty, calling some of his remarks sheer inventions of unsupported fantasy. They also say he's done grave injury to those who are his natural allies and an even graver injury to himself. Many who have listened to him with respect will never again accord him the same confidence. He has diminished his usefulness to his cause, to his country, and to his people, and that is a great tragedy. The Times says something very similar. Life says, they called his speech a demagogic slander that sounded like a script for Radio Hanoi. I mean, that's how foreign that kind of language sounds, Radio Hanoi. So that's the bad king. But after king dies, we have an icon king. It's sort of the southern preacher, the believer in nonviolence. I have a dream. Every you know, king holiday, we see, how are we doing on his dream? Well, not so well. Um, and that's sort of the, the mainstream view. Uh, but he also was claimed by a, a, an attorney in the Defense Department as, well, he, if he were alive, he would support these wars because he would understand what we're trying to do here is spread democracy and so forth. A complete contradiction of Martin Luther King, believe me. Um, and then you get the other kind of use of these icons, which is this one. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dreams. Before you can inspire, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Before you can touch, that all men are created. You must first connect. And the company that connects more of the world is Alcatel, a leader in communication networks. I have a dream for you. So Alcatel says, Alcatel says, if you have an important message, it doesn't matter if people can't hear your message. So anyway, that's where I'm going to end, and let's talk. How are we doing? So uh, to continue what we briefly discussed at the beginning, um, so the American public is used to commercial images and advertising by the time this battle starts. They've been conditioned by massive amounts of psychological advertising that, that hit the baby boomers in the post-war era. So when the 60s happened, it seemed like a great upheaval because this, this American tranquility, which was always a myth and not a reality, was being overturned. Uh, and then, so when the backlash hit, 
and people were told that the 60s weren't that great, it was what you described. They were conditioned, they were ready to swallow what I call stylized lying, which is what advertising is. Um, That's fair. Yeah. And otherwise, it wouldn't have been so easy to put away there. Well, I think in addition, people did behave you know, with, with a lot of fury. I mean, there's the counterculture. So people behave in, you know, ostentatiously rebellious, sexual, drug-using, uh, stylized ways that are a complete rejection of you. And so people look at that and say, oh my God, what's going on with our young people? Or the, you know, the weather underground, or the Panthers, you know? I mean, the Panthers, the Panthers hold a rally. I mean, the Panthers start with guns because they are trying to stop the police from roughing up the young black guys on the corners all the time, police brutality. And they use the law, which allows them to carry guns a certain way to get out of cars, to load guns, and to hold them down, and to save the police officer who's roughing up people, officers, whatever your name is, you have no right to do that, here's the one, such and such and such and such, and tell the young people, don't pay any attention to it, you don't have to move. And the police, and the California, etc., start to go crazy. And then they, they kind of somewhat crazily, protesting the effort to get rid of the guns, they change the gun laws, they march into the Sacramento legislature, which is where this, they're hearing this law, and, with their guns, and they're all arrested. So, Well, the point about the Panthers is the media never leave that image. They, it's always about the guns, it's always about violence, it's always about militancy, and they largely ignore, or if they don't ignore it, they see it as the Panthers' effort to do something to cover up or to get in the good with people when they have breakfast for children and other kind of things they do. And I'm not, you know, whatever you think of the Panthers, um, you know, there was a rationale for what they did and they probably didn't anticipate the kinds of responses they got. One of them was that young people said, whoa, we're going to join these guys because, damn, we'll have no more police bothering us. And so you get, you know, people drawn to them and other people saying, clamp down and get rid of them. So the government tries to get rid of it. So um, there's, there's authenticity of a kind in the protest, but it gets angry for what I think are very understandable reasons. It gets angry. So, so here's a, a quick question then. So did the press do this, A, because they had a political agenda, or B, they didn't want to upset their audience? So that they're, they're pre-practicing this CNN type of news presentation. Well, this side, we have that side, and we have vanilla, and we have chocolate, and we have coke, and we have Pepsi. I, I think that ideology in the press is very important. That is their own belief system. And what happens in a white press that goes south is they are shocked by what they see. They have no idea this is the way it was. But if they see students protesting the war, I mean, you think of anybody. Um, if you don't know about this, the Jim Crow, you know about the Constitution, you know about equal rights, you know that's what we're supposed to be about. And so that's a shock. If you see these young people that are kind of looking a little sort of blurry-eyed and crazy and you know, wearing and carrying Viet Cong flags and so forth, denouncing the war, what do we know about the war? Well, we know what the media tell us about the war, which is all framed in a way of defending and so forth. And we come from a World War II world where the United States has done this incredibly good thing with great sacrifice, so we're still doing it. And, and so what, what is there to cause them to say, wait a minute, I better, I better put this this way so that my editors will like it, or, you know, I mean, I don't, see, I'm saying that there's a, there's a, there's a gap there between a lot of press and all these movements. And what's very interesting is that really in about 64 and 65, it's when all these other movements start, when the target is no longer the South, but it's something about the United States. And when that happens, the press comes up with an explanation. You know what it is? Youth. It's, oh, what's with young people these days? Oh, they're baby boomers. Oh, they were raised by permissive parents. They expect the world. So that's what's going on. That explains this. And you get the generational frame, which is still there. I mean, take the media today. I mean, oh, I can go on. Here's an example. <laughs> this is commodified inside App Studios. This is uh, dated last Wednesday. 
Inside App Studios, creator, creator of the, the 60s for iPad, today launched the 60s free for iPad. The new app is a free download, yet provides all the features and content of the original app, plus, of course, advertising. The 60s free for iPad provides a multimedia journey of the 60s. The app delivers an experience of the 60s on the iPad that includes music, movies, events, video, vintage editorial, cartoons, and more. I bet you there's not a damn word about the United States as aggressor in Vietnam in that iPad. So it's a complete commodification. Buy the 60s and get nostalgic. You know, I mean, or wish you were there, or you know, whatever it is. But you know, all this playing on the boomers. I could, I, I, there's other images I could show you. You know, the boomers turn 50 in, in the cover of Time magazine. And then Newsweek, the boomers have turned 60. You know, it's like big news. <laughs> um, but that's because all of this was about a rebellious generation. So it becomes news when they sell out, quote unquote, in the big chill, or when they, you know, uh, discover new kinds of families, you know, or when they discover new kinds of retirement. You know, it's all about generation, which is utter nonsense. And it, it's to call the six to reduce the sixties. That is, make it irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's just about some bunch of people who were raised a certain way and nobody else has been since, theoretically. So, you know, goodbye past. You know, they like to be nostalgic. We'll give them nostalgic, you know, music for ads and so on and they can buy this thing, you know, so, sorry. So, <clears throat> talk about the baby boom. In, in the Middle East now, they talk about the youth bulge, you know, yeah. enabled by the technology, which is yeah. the internet. And so, you know, the technology of the 60s was surely cheap web offset allowing the growth of a alternate press, which kind of like died around 72 when inflation came and suddenly that wasn't possible, you know, and at the same time the mainstream media kind of learned their lesson, you know, to not give... Them New journalism, time. yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, could you comment a bit about, about the role of the, of, of the press and the technology that enabled the protests? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think it's probably very important. I mean, I think that the, the social media of today, are, it, it, people are saying, you know, again, people are saying, it's not causative. That's the, that's the thing. People will say, well, all this revolt in the Middle East is because of, you know, uh, um, what's the word? Twitter. <laughs> Twitter, thank you. Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, it's, but, it's very good it, but that's not causative, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, there was a very good quote yesterday from a journalist in London. She's at the Geneva Foreign Minister's meeting, and she said, what's different now is that when these these dictatorial, dictatorial regimes put something on the TV, you know, people don't have to believe it anymore because they can, they have, they can see an alternative. Yes, yes. It, I mean, it's very important to have access, to have media that give us access to outside the boundary ways of understanding the world. Very important, and the internet clearly does that. But there's there's two sides to all these media, you know? I mean, they can also be exploitative. They, the, the internet will be, I'm sure, commercialized. Um, it's on its way, unless we somehow get Congress to keep that from happening. Um, and, I mean, all these media were advertised, television was advertised as making democracy more more real, I mean, because now we can see our representatives and get to know them and feel closer to what's going on in government. Well, I, you know, I hate to say it, but they all get commercialized and then they become exploitative and they also narrow down what we get, which is not to say that people can't independently still interact with each other, and that is very important. That's, a, that's an important lateral form of communication. I, 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 I'm not saying anything against that. I agree with that. So it, it's facilitative. It's not causative. People aren't revolting because they have Twitter, right? The people didn't revolt because they had alternative press. Right, they didn't revolt because they had alternative press, right. They might have read the alternative press and say, hey, I think I'm gonna to go to that rally. No, they revolted because yeah. Goldman Sachs raised the price of wheat 10 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Their food became more expensive. There, there's a tendency, uh, part of the media, to impute all democratic uh, uh, upsurges to corporate products. Do you remember when people power happened in the Philippines? <laughs> that was because of uh, fax machines. You know, and, and Marcos is fine. Marcos, yeah. So, so there's this control that we. You know. Which is why I resist thinking of this as causative, because 
It's like youth caused the 60s, you know, youth didn't cause the 60s. The civil rights movement was people of all ages, the anti war yeah, movement was people of all it. ages. I mean, I, my experience is like more so in punk rock, but it was like Xerox came cheap, people could copy cassettes, and mm -hmm. you know, people couldn't publish before, and you began to have peer to peer you know, publishing, and it, took, and it took away the, the power of the middle to set the agenda you know, in yep. music. And I see the same thing kind of happening in the 60s. Yes. You know, and I see the same thing happening yes. now. Yes, yes. It's, it's very important. And, and I think the system will try to get rid of, in some way, those media which are facilitative. They will try to do something. They will make it more difficult. They will try to overwhelm me with something else to come up with some other. I, I mean, I, I just don't. I mean, that's that. It's not just um, just that it's maybe more expensive to use something. I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe that's how it happens. But those protests are a threat. They are a threat to power, they're a threat to the United States. Those protests are a threat to the United States, not just to those yeah, As you say, it's a cycle where the thing becomes, you know, eventually, you know, engulfed and, and adopted and, you know, you know, the, every time you get a new, a new technology like this, there's a big explosion to begin with, you know, even if it's like when they first got mass media, it was fascism and things like this, you know, and mass mobilization, uh -huh. you know, so, so, you know, is it just that we're, we each have a cycle every time we have a new technology and there's a new bunch of youth, we're going to have a new oh, that's you know, an turnover? Theory, you know yeah. I mean? yeah, I mean, I, I, that's an interesting theory. You know, I mean, television played a role in helping people see what was happening in the South. But photography did too, or Life magazine. So, I don't know. I mean, I, we should hear from young people on this, you know? Yeah, I'm waiting for some young people to ask <laughs> question, make a comment. I'm not a tweeter, you know, a Twitter or whatever you call it. Now don't date yourself. I will. No, I'm not. I have. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. No? Just taking this in? Some of you guys are in his class and read the book, right? <clears throat> right? Yeah. Yeah, they did. They read it. Okay. Gee. Do you like how the other person? <laughs> yeah, you look pretty young. You okay. Pretty young, yeah. Um, so I just have, I have a question about. Uh, you, know, you raised this question at the beginning about how do we get from here to here, yeah. right? Yeah. So aside from sort of all-out repression of movements, aside from a, a sort of uh, clampdowns against radicalism and that kind of thing, is there, do you think that, like what do you think of the idea that the sort of, re, sort of recuperation of 60s radical ideas, it, as it becomes sort of uh, maybe mainstream, you start with the Alcatel ad, and you can buy an app now for 1968 on the iPad or whatever it is. Like, as those ideas become sort of more watered down and diluted and sort of recuperated into mainstream culture, is that then? The ideas, the, the ideas disappeared. disappeared. The ideas are no longer there. Uh -huh. right. I mean, it's not that the Vietnam War was this and that was horrible. I mean, that is another. That is another conversation. I mean, I think we need a truth and reconciliation process in this country, but. Um, it is that the war taught people something about American foreign policy. That's relevant today because it's the same American foreign policy. So, but, but, but where did the, the, the sort of, to what extent was the spirit of radicalism crushed, sort of uh, materially, or was it sort of diluted and incorporated into other kinds of more traditional, like, acceptable liberal politics? Most people who were involved in 60s movements, from every source that I've looked at, still are involved in similar politics, whether they're somewhat less radical. I'm more radical than I was in the 60s. Um, the 80s taught me, my God, it's happening again. I mean, you know, and so, hmm, this is systemic kind of. Anyway, what I mean by radical is you're, you're I mean, for, radical does not mean bomb throwing and militant. That's militant. Radical means you're fundamentally critical of the institutions and ways in which the institutions are a fundamental reason why we have these problems. That's radical, in my view. So I don't know if that's what you mean, but those ideas are, they didn't go away. I mean, people still live believing those ideas and are active. You know, as you get older, you have families and you have houses and you have jobs, you don't, and you have less energy. You, you don't take to the streets as much. And also, you know, I mean, why? Um, uh, but, you teach or you write or you talk to people or you exchange ideas, you read, you do stuff that is part of people's lives, exchanging those ideas. And those ideas are still there, they're still 
people, I mean, people I know who are active in the 60s are still active. So part of it is the myth that all those 60s people sold out. You know, that is a total myth. Certainly plenty of people in the 60s became, you know, very wealthy yuppies in the 80s and, you know, et cetera. And, you know, we have George Bush in this generation. I mean, this Newt Gingrich, there's a whole slew of them who are not... <laughs> Actually, I think that, that experience kind of explains that phenomenon, too, because they were kind of left out of the 60s. They were left out by the media's attention to these movements, and they didn't like that. And they thought this country's gone haywire, paying so much attention to these people. we got to get it back. So that's had something to do with why we are where we are today, too. I don't know if I really answered your question. We can talk about it more. Uh, any other questions, comments? Somebody from this class. Come on. He wants somebody in his class to answer. I, I would like one. that. Meg, yes? Um, there we go. So I'm interested in what, what you're talking about, the, the tight narrative versus the potential of the image. So the image may be um, yeah. to mobilize or to uh, reach a level of connection that the media won't allow. Um, yeah. And that, in combination with what seems to be almost two separate narratives, one of the youth of the 1960s and one of what's going on today. Like, they, they don't seem to connect um, it, right, like they could right. as much as they could. Okay, yeah. You know, so if we're looking yeah. at how do we get people to see what's what the, the protests today in the Middle East and Wisconsin as connect part, part of systemic kind of mm -hmm. um, genealogy, like mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. as descending from yeah. what was happening in the 60s, yeah. not in the way that the media is portrayed as commercialized or, dis or kind of um, dissolved you know, into fluff, but <coughs> what was really going on, which I think is what you're yeah. trying to talk about. Like, yeah. Do you think there's a potential or some way to mobilize the image to make that connection that the narrative can't do? So when, when today the media is kind of restrained from making that connection more, maybe allowing for a different level of mobilization. Mobilization of job not just saying, well, the youth today, you know, or like you know, people, the people who are involved now who maybe would be, like you're saying, mm -hmm. were involved in the 60s, but would kind of connect to what's going on now. Do you think the image has can play a, a, a more, a role that it's not playing, basically? Or, you know? I, I think probably playing? not by itself. Okay. I think that there's such an overlay of mythology that explains those images that people are just going to... It's sort of like um, what Susan Sontag said about photographs in the Vietnam War versus the Korean War. Well, right? The Korean War, nobody did anything with those images. They're pretty horrible images, but they're sort of, well, they're, they're communists and this is a war. So in Vietnam, it was very different. So it's the contestation around the image that creates the openness to, in some ways, what the image could convey. I think the the stories of these movements, I mean, that's what I teach a course in the 60s, and I taught it for 25 plus years. Invariably, students, I mean, it's interesting over the years, students coming in with their own prepackaged ideas about what they're about to study, and a lot of it's the counterculture and, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and probably some crazy militants, and what else happened then? But um, they invariably are profoundly moved by not only the experiences of the people in the movements through video, very importantly, Eyes and the Prize, et cetera, and, and readings from the movements uh, that speak to them. And the end, of, the end of the course, I asked them to sort of compare the world they grew up into, what they studied young people growing up in back then, and they, they will often say, I feel my values are very similar to those people's values, um, but I just don't see where to make a difference. Where where do I plug in? I don't see it happen. I don't, and, you know, and so there's this kind of a, and it's not youth, it's everybody. Where do I, how do I, can we, you know, I mean, that's, that's the time. I mean, one of the problems is that our culture is so image saturated. That's what I was going to say. Is it yeah, maybe it's not that, you know, we'll see an image today and maybe it'll be, oh my God, and then psh, there's another one and pretty soon. So people don't value themselves as human beings or citizens. They just think, look for a consumer model in which to squeeze their surface self into. And when they can't, they, they don't see the avenue to be the citizen. How do I do that? What's that mean? I mean part of it's the world is so different. You know, the, the, the diversions, the media, the, the, I mean, you know, talking in your your phone, your cell phone all the time. You get out of classes, call your friends, you walk across campus. I mean, um, 
where's, where's room in there to sort of pay attention to citizenship? And I remember growing up in very smaller towns, and oh yeah, everybody participates. They show up at town meetings, and you know, <laughs> different. So it's imaginable. I hear the Port Huron statement, well, that really makes sense. Wow. You say, you know, which, you know, an image that's as powerful today. And I'd say that the video footage WikiLeaks put out of the people who were shooting at journalists yeah. in Iraq was yeah. as powerful as yeah. anything. Yeah. Oh, there are, uh, yes, there are incredible images. I mean, Abu Ghraib um, or, you know, um, Somalia dragging the body. I mean, those are, those are images that are visceral in their impact. And, and um, but I, so it's not just overwhelmed by imagery that we can't see and can't react. We do, but uh, how many of you aren't, aren't busy enough, you know? I mean, <laughs> um, there's a lot that's different, and it's making it easier to sort of say, what can you do? I, I talked in the last chapter about the media culture and the future of democracy, and I do believe that community organizing is a piece because community organizing, it's, it's, not, it's necessary but not sufficient because community organizing gets communities of people together talking to each other about what do I see in my community that we need to address and builds from that into starting to address it and starting to learn the kind of empowerment that comes from that participation and have some little victories. It's, you know, that's good community organizing, little victories. So you feel we sure can make a difference in, in this community. We can do things about things. And, but community organizing tends to stay local. And the problems are global. And they're caused by these large institutions. So there needs to be this connecting going on. And I think there's a role for a master teacher in like a King or a Malcolm or somebody who really ignites the community with a vision and sees the connections with the larger world. And manages not to get shot. Yeah, and, and then, you know, if we had real third parties, parties are what are supposed to be how you organize around a coalition of different groups of people, but that's a whole other story. You had a question? Oh, I was just wondering what the emphasis was that Marco put on in your book, for example, in the context of your class, if you could explain that for us. Well, there's actually people from two classes here. One is one is media criticism. Okay, so it's obvious what the relevance is to that. The other is an undergraduate course uh, called the Culture Industries, which is about how uh, things like media concentration and hyper-commercialism and political pressure and so on affect the work people do in all the culture industries across the board. You know, from news to TV production to filmmaking to music to book publishing. So we spent the first month on the news and we had every week people from those industries come in, you see. So we had a, a lot of great journalists who, because they're great journalists, are now out in the wilderness. Yeah, they used to be at Newsweek or you know, right. CBS, now they have websites, right? right. Uh, so they come in and they tell their stories, right? And it's completely eye-opening. And, and, and much of the enlightenment there has to do with the fact that the vision of the reality that we get from the media is uh, oversimple, to put it mildly, right. Right. and kind of narcotic. When you have people come in and talk about stuff, as you would put it, from outside those boundaries, it, 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 it's extremely enlightening. So I asked students from that course to come to hear Ted talk about this because the standard vision of the 60s that we get is not only false, but debilitating. It's profoundly debilitating because it was just a bunch of people, you know, getting high and, and waving around Viet Cong flags, right? Just to bring this back to the question of, of images, images by themselves, although extremely powerful, uh, can't do the job of an event like this or a book like this, right? When you consider the vision of the 60s that we get from the media, you get no sense of teachings, for example, right? You get no sense of, of the sort of long, careful explanations that people would provide to illuminate the whole, right? I'm thinking of, of Philip Agee, whose book, uh, CIA, uh, Inside the Company, a CIA Diary, came out in 75. It was a bestseller. 
This guy was a, you know, a renegade uh, CIA agent who basically told the world what he'd been doing, what the CIA had been doing. Well, this wasn't just that he named names, which he did, he named agents, but he actually demonstrated, if you had the patience to get through the whole book, which, I mean, which is a riveting book, exactly what the CIA's function was throughout the third world vis-a-vis -vis the interests of American business, you know? That's the kind of thing you cannot get from an image. Now, this is not, again, to say that images aren't incendiary. You showed that picture of life, from Life magazine of the, of the benevolent soldier and the little kid. Pick up any copy of the New York Times. You get the same images now of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It hasn't changed a bit. So that stuff is just as carefully policed. Uh, images that come out of left field are just as uh, upsetting to the establishment, but they're not enough. You know, images themselves are not enough especially in a culture like ours, in which everybody's a star. Everybody's got his own Facebook page. You know what I'm saying? So it's what you call in your book a kind of affective uh, um, affective empowerment is fake empowerment, you know? I, I can't recommend this book strongly enough. I, you know, you really have to buy a copy and, and read it through Camille. You suggested earlier that um one of the big questions for the, the would-be activists is, is, you know, where do I plug in to a movement? And personally, I'm wondering, you know, I have been plugged in and I plugged out because I became very disenchanted um, at the way the organization was run. It was a big, well-funded organization and it was just so inefficient and counterproductive and yada, yada, yada. Um, so, and I, I noticed in your book, you did a really good job of explaining how messy and experimental the movement was. And I would love to embrace that sort of explorative, you know, mindset. I, I resist that. I get very, you know, maybe this is a better question for my therapist, but how do I overcome the, the disenchantment of, of what, what I have to plug into right now? Huh. Well, what kind of went off in my head right off the bat was when you said well-funded group or whatever it was, and I kind of wondered, it started my brain wondering, hmm, well, I wonder what that organization is, and sometimes, you know, significant funding will have a big impact on what the organization, you know, they'll spend more time staffing varieties of people staffing different things, and I think you can very quickly lose the kind of fire and direction that comes from the grassroots. I mean, it's sort of like, I, there's not an easy answer to your question. I mean, like community organizing groups often, you know, they say about them after five years, they're sort of become part of the, the game. You know, they're like another interest group and they're lobbying and, you know, so even they, in a way, lose some of that. So um, I guess that's kind of part of what happens. Well, um, yeah, but you're in New York, my gosh, you know? <laughs> You gotta try this Bethlehem. This is in Oregon. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, can you tell us what the group was? The um, well-funded oh, group? Oh, God. <laughs> um, they, they do wonderful things. Uh, Basic Rights Oregon, they hmm. um, support all kinds of human rights initiatives. Yeah. So. Yeah. There are, I mean, there are thousands. You know the book Blessed Unrest by Paul Hawken? Do you know that book? No, what's the book? Blessed Unrest, he's a guy who goes around and lectures about the uh, environment. And this book is about what, what he learned giving lectures around the world about the, the deteriorating e ecosphere is that after every lecture there'd be hordes of people coming down front and exchanging cards and talking to each other and so forth. And he started saying, you know, this is incredible. Everywhere I go, there are people doing this. And so he started to try and go online and try and get some sense in his estimation. I don't know how he made the estimation. Is there something like two million groups around the world struggling at the grassroots level for social justice and or sustainability or both. And um, he calls it the greatest social movement in history. Now, he also says it's non-ideological, which means in a sense, I, the way I'm interpreting that, it doesn't have an explanation for why we have these problems that is shared. So that becomes an issue. And people can kind of fire off this way and fire off that way and you get real inefficiency and in really confronting the source of things. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I am a believer in human beings' ability to um, learn um, about the world and to communicate that learning with others and to, I mean, there's a lot, not a little book you ought to read maybe, it's uh, Francis Moore LaPay's book, Getting, Getting, Getting a Grip, a grip. Getting a Grip 2 now, there's two. 
wonderful little book, and she's been a lifelong activist, a food activist. Um, but she argues, you know, she starts arguing at the beginning, well, you know, brains, brain research is showing us that human beings are in fact wired with empathy. We are inherently empathic beings. And humans also have to, we know from, um, um, <laughs> word went out of my head, sorry. Um, evolution, there you go. We know from evolution that humans have to collaborate, that they are, are able to collaborate. In fact, their survival depends on the collaboration. And we know that people seek meaning in life. What would happen if we trusted those human qualities with our institutions? We had institutions that trusted and nurtured those qualities instead of institutions which said humans are basically self-interested. Because that's what we've got. And when you've got that as your model for that's what humans are universally, you get everything else that goes with that. You get the accumulation of wealth in few hands. You get the exploitation of the resources and so forth. You get people thinking, I better be self-interested because everyone else is, and you know, it's a race. So maybe that, she's got, she also has all kinds of little, you know, connecting links and stuff. She's actually speaking right now. I was, oh no. She was competing with you. She turned around and she was speaking. No, no, no. She's holding a food politics talk. Right now. So we've got that, and we got the underground, the book, the guy in the underground press of the 60s. All, I see this is New York, and this is driving me nuts. <laughs> Something you said for beyond that. Um, I can a little bit late, so I'm not sure if you addressed this, but I can when you were talking about the internet as having um, uh, the Egypt and uh, mm -hmm. the kind of facilitates such a um, But to, I, it just occurred to me that it seems that. What's, um, what's been happening has been proving that social networking being used for facilitating social movement um, kind of necessitates that this sort of lowest common denominator of uh, democracy and, and liberalism is kind of has to be appealed to in using, in using them. So I was just wondering if you had what, what you thought about the form of social networking and maybe the interest in general being you know, even hailed even by its proponents of being in this really supremely democratic mm -hmm. form. How do you subvert that and make it work towards something against democracy, essentially? How do you subvert it for radical causes and not having to appeal to See, the I think common denominator? Working for democracy would be radical, but that's another, that's another, that's where I, that's how I define democracy. It's not what we have, but that's another issue. Um, Um, I, I guess my feeling, I don't know, my feeling about those media is that they're, well, I, I fall back on something like this, on meetings, on face-to-face. -face. That is, those media can get you into the places where you meet face-to-face. -face. For instance, Seattle in 1999, you have people from all over the world in Seattle protesting the uh, World Trade Organization. But they also had a whole series of workshops and lectures and people, uh, um, um, can't remember her name, uh, Vandana Shiva from India talking about agriculture and dams Anandani in Roy. India and, and, and Anandani Roy. And so it was, a, it was a global exchange. The social forums, you know, they're, they're global. I, I just feel that it's got to be a lot of face-to-face -face conversation. And I think, among other things, I think the left needs to talk to the right. I don't mean the organizers of the right, but the people who are drawn to the right because they're really pissed off at losing ground. And so um, democracy, the way I see democracy, is um, not a system of government. It's a way of life. And it's a way of life which empowers the people. All of, it's, non -ex it's, not, it's inclusive and it's empowering. And it starts with conversation. So those, those media can facilitate conversation, can get you to a place, to a protest, to a rally, and so forth, but what, what's going to happen then? So I, that's where I'm coming from. I'm not sure I'm kind of getting at your question. But maybe you can come back and tell me. Yeah, more. no, I, I guess what I was trying to, I mean, I wasn't really trying to focus on whether the interaction was going to stop on the digital but yeah. rather that if, in fact, the left talks to the right, there's, I mean, if, if this is to be realized on a large scale, and 
And those kinds of dialogues have to seek that kind of common ground that would, would sort of automatically have to come back, come back to the center, sort of the center of, of you know, Oh, I don't, all, all those watchwords. Of, no, I don't agree. I mean, it's like the third way is in the middle between these. I mean, that's so. That's the mainstream media's language for. You know, we've got the left, which means Obama, right, and we've got the right, which is the Republicans, and what we really need is somebody in the middle because these are extreme. Well, that's just you know, that doesn't even touch it. That's just all kind of not really dealing with the issue. What I think needs to happen is, you know, if 60% of the American public thinks, no, raise taxes rather than cut back on these Wisconsin workers or, or break the unions. Those are important things. Um, if 60% don't answer the way that one that economist, which you missed, the economist talking about somebody who says, you know, I've really got it so bad, I want to make sure you're not getting away with anything better than I've got, which is a change from, you've got it better than I do, so I'm going to make sure my, my company, my union, treats me the same. So it's, it's been flipped. So now I'm doing badly and I'm really struggling in the world, I've got to make sure these teachers and these policemen, you know, they got to suck getting these cush retirements, you know. So it's that shift. There are common interests that cannot be met by the system. Capitalism. Um, and I don't know when it happens, but, you know, things, uh, crises cause people to sort of wake up. And um, this is a crisis, it's sort of a crisis happening where the, the right is pushed this agenda of get rid of government, get rid of tax, you know, catch your taxes. Have they pushed it finally too far? And so the public starts to say, wait a minute, you know? And we've been getting screwed all these years because of that, not this. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, I do believe people can uh, have awakening. I mean, you know, Rosa Parks goes to this, the Highlander School, and she sees blacks and whites working together as equals for the first time in her life. And she says, my God, it can actually happen. And her life has changed. And so she goes with it, you know, and gets involved with the NAACP and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, she happened to be at a pivotal place at a pivotal time when um, things gelled. I mean, Howard Zinn's little book, um, Can't Move a uh, Can't Stay Neutral in a Moving Train, wonderful little, it's his auto, it's his memoir kind of, and he says people are struggling all the time to make life better for them and their environment, their communities and so forth. All the time it's going on. It was going on in the South all the time, little scales, and at some moment, wham, it comes together and you've got a mass movement. So in a sense, you got to keep doing it because you don't know if it's going to happen, you don't know when it's going to happen, but you got to keep doing it because as Chomsky says, if you don't, you know what is going to happen. So that's kind of where I come. I don't know. Yeah, 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 you mentioned Rosa, I'm just going to conclude. Uh, Rosa Parks, you know, the media's version of Rosa Parks is that she was just a tired, a tired yeah. woman yeah, she was who tired. got fed up. You know, missing from that version of what she did is her whole affiliation with the movement. Maybe George W. Bush was hailing Rosa Parks as this tired woman who you know, stood up. <laughs> That there was a there was a movement there, and the nature of these images is always completely depoliticized Absolutely. the content to turn the '60s into a spectacle, you know, like Woodstock, right? Anyway, uh, speaking of the '60s, uh, I just want to tell you uh, that our our next uh, next month's author is Lorraine Minight uh, from Colombia, who's got a book called The Myth of Voter Fraud which is really, you know, as relevant as can be to everything that Ted's been talking about. The whole struggle for voting rights uh, has completely disappeared from the establishment discourse. And even from uh, a lot of historical studies of the civil rights movement, the, the, you know, the crucial uh, element of uh, electoral democracy is just kind of vanished, it's disappeared. And this is largely because the right has succeeded in, in persuading people that there's this epidemic voter fraud by uh, evil 
black Democrats were doing the equivalent of stuffing ballot boxes. She has studied this and, and has discovered that there is not a shred of evidence to support any of this. That election fraud is committed on a massive scale through electronic means and primarily, although not only, by the Republicans, by the right. Uh, and that gets us into extremely fertile territory <laughs> because many of the right's electoral victories of the last uh, 10 or 11 years have actually not been victories at all. Uh, so she'll be here on the first Tuesday in April to talk about that book. I urge you to come, uh, keep your eye on the website for McNally Jackson Bookstore. And thank you all for coming, and thanks, Ted, for a terrific uh, talk. Thank you.